So, so can people Yeah, so someone should go to a video that I'll... Tisha, can you... I'll send you the URL for the video. Okay. I just sent it to you. Can you check if the sound is at all acceptable? Okay. This is kind of awesome. You can display just one screen, just not that. All right, I can see you. Oh, do you want to put this one on? Yeah. Oh, do you want to put this one on? That's an improvement. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah. Video. <laughs> <laughs> but like, if I stand here and talk, is it sufficiently loud? Well, like, if I stand here and talk, yes. It's like so the time lagging is like garbage here a little bit, but it's not horrible. Wait. Time lagging is See, now you can hear me. Wait, wait, wait. It's not horrible. Girl, wait. Girl, wait. Girl, wait. Uh, it'll be fine when we mute her. Yeah, I think it's fine. Just turn off the computer. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, yeah. So okay, we can we can try this. I'll. Yes. It was a hangout on air, which is like broadcast hangout. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I guess we can get started probably. Now that. Jeez, that does not. That does not. This cool. Okay. Uh, Examples. Um, I want you to sort of help me brainstorm some things at some point, which is where we're going to start about um, what makes a good puzzle and what you like. What do you enjoy doing? What and how to avoid those sorts of things that make them sad for you. We're going to ignore the shining on it. When you go to solve a puzzle, what makes you like the puzzle? What makes you need the puzzle? And feel free to cite specific examples. Um, I was, I spent some time over the last couple of days rereading the solutions to this year's hunt, to the one that we bought answers to, um, and trying to withhold my frustration at someone's feeling that that was a good idea for a puzzle, followed by four more steps that were all equally bad ideas for puzzles. <laughs> um, so the goal for today is to sort of remind you that you want to make things that you would enjoy doing and avoid things that are bad. For the most part, most of the things that are bad are easily avoidable. There are some that you're never going to avoid because there are things that come out of nowhere. But um, what do you like or not like? Either way. Um, bad is puzzles that are too under constrained that you have you can't tell if you're making progress. You have an answer set that's 
an answer. Yeah, well, the set of answers you think is an answer to like what part of the puzzle? We have no idea if it's right, and you just have to go blind. Right. Um, so there's under constrained and. Nothing at any point that confirms that even what you're doing is right. And there's actually a term for that. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, one thing that's good is having feedback when you see something and you like realize that this is probably, I'm, I'm probably going on the right path. And I'm actually going to call this, this has a name in the MIT puzzle hunt history. This is referred to as the Taipei problem. And we're going to go and look at Taipei today. It's the name of a puzzle. And it is the puzzle that basically epitomizes there are a million things you could do, all of which seem equally good, and there's no confirmation of any of them being right or wrong until you ask backwards, stumble upon the right one. Yes? So one of the, uh, uh, one of the more frustrating puzzles that I worked on was streetcar names. <laughs> uh, because, but I figured it out eventually, but because the, the two phrases they, they were trying to spell out, they were using country names to spell it, but they didn't use all the letters in the country names in the answer. So you had like A P A N, and you didn't need a J anywhere. And so it was all, it took much longer than it should to figure out that little hobbit. Or lack of consistency and oh man, not to spell superfluous. <laughs> I can't spell, so be warned. Um, that's why I solve puzzles and have things I can look crap up for. Um, also, there should be spelling things caliber, like the phrases you were supposed to find were misspelled, which didn't work very well. That was <laughs> Yes, I, I, my, my favorite was solving this, this year um, sort of the epitome for me of, of we got to the answer, it was a day and a half later, a good thing, and that was the one with uh, there was the picture of all the album covers that were cut into strips. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so very quickly we had cut them out and discovered right away which album covers there were. Um, we had arranged them on the album covers, then another person realized that, you know, um, so we were trying to index into each album cover title, then another person noticed that each of these album covers had a title song that was actually on a different album, and we tried indexing into that, and then someone actually laid them out in Photoshop after like three hours of work of intimately finding where they were, then we started indexing into the albums as long as you misspelled one of the album titles right. And then we had a bunch of letters that we then put back into the original craptastic grid that it started with. And then we got a clue phrase with an ambiguous, hard-to-research answer. It was exactly what you didn't want. Um, far too many steps, very little confirmation until you got to the end. And in the end, you wanted the plural of cello, which is cellos or celli. So you go, hmm, let's guess which one to call in first. Exactly what you don't want in a puzzle, like it, nine of my pet peeves sort of wrapped into one. And that's when I solved. So, <laughs> but that also took 45 man hours worth of people to get to that point. And there were many, many other puzzles. So, sorry, that was... <laughs> but that brings us to um, like a puzzle that's too long or too large. Like I'm specifically thinking of the one that had like 267 clips, and the concept is really awesome. And it would have been really cool had it just been like small clips. You know, um, there's just too much turning. So, so the, the wonderful thing is, so far you have like. You keep saying all the things on my list of things that are the most important. One is that there's nothing wrong with having a difficult, challenging puzzle, but it shouldn't be difficult and challenging. Well, thank you for doing that. Because it's seven times longer than a human would want to do. Um, something that is good. I like it when the answer matches everything else with the puzzle. Like something that's like all the things in the puzzle have to do with this one thing. And the And 
and that is a big thing. And that is the hardest thing to do, which is why the moral of today's story is making a good puzzle is hard. Making a crappy puzzle, actually quite easy. Oh, I was just going to ask that. Uh, the, the puzzles where there's the, the process, when you look back at it and it makes perfect sense, uh, like the really, really tight puzzles are, once you figure them out, it's it a good feeling. And, Right, almost to the point where where you would say that that once you figured out what to do, it you know it may take you a while to get there, but you know all along the way where it's going to go, and it's beautiful, and you're happy to get there. Uh, on the, the same topic of sort of all of those things, there was the um, the Marty Fitchip meta where you had the, oh, the Enigma, and like I thought that was I thought that. Was Pretty neat, and you made three wheel enigma and everything like that. And then after you figure out the like, positions of all the wheels and everything like that, you now have to go through and you know just run it serially through every single answer in the Marty Bishop round before you you know you get some of the, the praise that it, it's like you got all the aha and it was nice, but now you have like two hours more work. It was, it was and 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 I actually have that down, which is. Um, <laughs> and this happened a lot in this hunt. You did something, you knew what you were doing, it was awesome, you get all the way through it only to find that you just spent seven hours to get another thing you couldn't tell what it was or it was going to be miserable to do. I'm just sort Someone of on a, a puzzle that's, a puzzle that's uh, over constrained so that it's just pitch work. Someone on the internet also suggests boar theory is an example of bad food phrases. What is boar theory? theory, it's a puzzle, is an example of bad food phrases. I don't know if yeah, so bad food phrases. Um, there, was, there was one puzzle this year which we solved, and it took us five times to get the right answer that went with the clue phrase. We were just sort of changing the words in the answer because it was like, do they want this? Do they want this? Yeah, uh, this is sort of answers parallel with the puzzle and sort of uh, lack of consistency or, or lack of self-checking. But uh, answers should look like they are answers. You know, they, they should be generally nouns and fairly simple. Uh, and so, for example, um, in the 2004 hunt, um, there, we had, Am I allowed to bring that up? We had a lot of, well, I don't know if anyone else was here for that, but I was. Um, we had a lot of answers that were either very obscure words or rection, occasionally not words at all. Uh, rection being the most... Rection, I had no problem solving with uh, Bay Winery. Uh, I had the problems uh, with it. But uh, there's that, and then also on this particular, on this hunt in the Final runaround. The the, um, the number pad that was the Rubik's cube. Uh, we got something that looked like a clue phrase, like it was oh, yeah. ten words long, and you know we were trying to figure out what it clued so that we could clue the answer into that. But no, we had to type in the clue phrase with spaces. With spaces. <laughs> So 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 puzzles should have reasonable <laughs> expectations. Let's find a this way of saying that. You've had your hand up for a really long time. Oh, um, just I remember the trophies, etc., which was a puzzle based off the XKC comic about trophies. Um, it broke its own mechanic. The whole entire point of the comic was that like everything is popular on the internet can be made of like of two words that are both trophies. But to solve the puzzle, you had to search on Etsy for a bunch of things that were three trophies long. And that's completely counter to what the puzzle was. So it was completely Yeah. And, and, and that's going to be, I mean, the moral of the story is everything that falls in here in the world of puzzles is what I like to call elegance. All the puzzles I like, the ones I remember really, 
much later. And they don't even have to be, sometimes I also like things to be something, wow, I've never thought of that before. That's amazing. But you can't necessarily predict that. And also, it's different, because you can come up with something that's amazing, wow, someone did it 10 years ago, but no one remembers. So that's just as good. Um, but it's, it all boils down to elegance. Everything that you come here means that you know you don't want to just go, I want to write a puzzle about this topic because this topic is cool, and you just start slapping random facts together that all encompass that topic, thinking that becomes a puzzle. It has to be, just as you said, if you want it to be about everything being pairs of trochees, your puzzle has to be about pairs of trochees. And your final clue phrase should be parallel with that, too. There were a number of puzzles in this year and other years where you get to the end, and because you don't know, is this my answer? Is this a bad clue phrase? And then why is the mechanism in the last step not the same as what I have been doing in all the other steps of the process? Or why is there just one thing that makes something incredibly inelegant? So I'm a chemistry professor, and I also teach a puzzle class. And I unfortunately have run the mystery hunt three times. <laughs> and I won the 2004 hunt, so I ran the 2005 one. Um, but the chemistry puzzle this year, I could not solve. Which one was that? Uh, it was the one that turned out to be element named cryptograms of a bunch of other chemicals. It was in one of the later rounds. Was it the one that was like, you had to put them on a grid? Or? So it was basically, you were given a bunch of properties and a bunch of chemicals. Oh. And then I knew that I had to use that to basically give me binary. The problem being that as a chemist, I knew the correct answers. And so I was trying to do that. But you actually had to know the wrong definitions for the words to get it to work. Um, and so <laughs> I actually called in, and I was like, I'm having problems with this. And they actually told me that I know too much chemistry to solve the problem puzzle and that someone should find someone who only knows, um, who only uses Wikipedia to look up things to solve it. <laughs> However, I looked on Wikipedia, Wikipedia also correctly agreed with me about the <laughs> definitions of these words. Still angry. So uh, one thing that isn't sort of every puzzle, but a common uh, puzzle thing that I like and I think fits elegantly is um, reusing a mechanic in a hierarchical way, like you do something, some transform to a bunch of clues, and then you apply that same mechanic to the things you get out of it to get the answer. Yeah. 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 I'm talking about something along the lines of, uh, I believe it was called wordplay from this hunt, which I think was actually a good puzzle. And you had crossword style clues in groups, in like five or six per group. And you solved those and found out the, that the words all fit some sort of pattern where the pattern clued a particular letter. Uh, for example, they might be all words with only one vowel. And so you take the letters and you spell some, some new words. And each of those new words fits one of those patterns that you've already identified. And, and that's the thing, is, is that in the end, the moral of the story is that you want to try to think of that awesome thing that has, let's say, two levels. <laughs> no, not three or four. But, and that parallelism is what gets you elegance. 50% of the time, because you do something, you enjoy what you're doing, you get something in the end, and you go, oh my god, this is set up, so I have to do it one more time. And But the thing is, it's not easy to make something that does that. And so, and in many cases, you piss people off by introducing one inelegancy to a puzzle that they can never get beyond and four years later still hold a grudge to the seven hours they spent staring at that thing, which is not necessarily um, a bad thing. Um, the good news is that all of the things that you've mentioned so far under the bad column are avoidable ones. Now, there are other bad things where it's like, uh-oh, there were two possible answers, and none of your test solvers found it and all that sort of stuff, and that stuff sort of happens and it just sucks, but, you know, life sucks sometimes, and there will be puzzles that don't work as perfectly as you did. 
or it was test solved wonderfully by everyone on your team and no one else in the world could solve it. Um, and that is not an uncommon problem because you tend to be on a team with people who think like you do. And so. So can I just, uh, can someone scribe the board into either the chat room or into YouTube comments? Oh. Because that's where like, because the, the camera's not quite good enough to read well. the board well. Um, Oh, that's true. Yeah. Um. Great. Yeah. Andrew. No. Um, you brought up something else that is something that is really important to think about when you're making a puzzle. And I want to sort of emphasize this as being your friend. If I told each of you right now that I wanted you to write 10 trivia questions about things, it would suck. It would be miserable. I don't know what I want to write about. However, most of the time if I then say I want you to write 10 trivia questions that are all constrained by something, it gets a little more fun for you to do. There's limits to the answers that you now can possibly have and you're kind of working backwards. The same thing is true when you're making a puzzle. You want there to be constraints in what you're doing for two reasons. One, it helps you find things that are all interesting and all go together. And from the perspective of the solver, it's going to help the solving if there was a constraint that all the things on there went into. And a lot of the puzzles that we seem to like are these things that have constraints. But it's really the puzzle maker's friend to have a highly constrained sort of thing. Yes, it may take you four weeks to find 20 examples of things that have that constraint, but I promise you it is well worth that grueling search. Um, another thing is um, there are some red herrings that you put into a puzzle because you're evil, and you intentionally put it in there. Like the first letters of this don't spell anything. It's a perfectly good way of of having something in there that, you know, like having it actually spell out that sentence. Mm -hmm. um, and you do things like that, which is like, oh, look, I can look here. Oh, crap, that didn't give me anything. And sometimes you can do that. A lot of times, most of the red herrings we introduce are things that when you don't know what you're doing, you can find anything in a set of things. And so what I'm going to talk about when we, I want to show you some puzzles from the past and some puzzles I've made mostly as a way of showing you ways of avoiding introducing red herrings that you, you can control yourself um, that will make the solving easier because you go, oh, this can't be part of the answer because these are in a certain order, that sort of thing. Um, and lastly, there's nothing wrong with making puzzles with other people. It may be your idea, but I would say that most of the best puzzles I've ever made, I have a good idea and went, there's no way in hell my skill set involves making this. I need to find work with. And this gets you a couple of different things. One is, I have made lots and lots of puzzles. I can't make a grid of letters to save my life. <laughs> However, I have been involved in many good grid puzzles because I had an idea. I found one of my friends who can make a grid, and we made it happen. One example of this is, Oh, it's Denali, so it must have been the Monopoly hunt. <laughs> so there was a crossword puzzle that you just filled it in. And if you actually looked closely at it, that the letters in Denali, right to left, top to bottom, going through it, were spelled out just sort of randomly the puzzle was constructed to have a place where there were four D's and a square in the grid, four E's. And conveniently, these letters in English are common enough that you could do that. If you wanted a J, it would be really hard to get four double J answers to cross in the same spot. Like, really easy to come up with this idea. It took you know, a month for one person to then make this puzzle. But that's the sort of thing. Do not be ashamed if you have a good idea to share it with other people. Because there's sometimes I've come up with ideas I just couldn't do, and there's other times I've come up with awesome ideas and then I talk to someone else and they were like, no, you're crazy. It's a nice start, 
But most of the things in terms of I have a good idea for a topic, but bouncing things off of other people is a good way to figure out how to have a doubly parallel mechanism, how to get an answer out of something. Because for the most part, most puzzles you end up having to index into something somehow. So indexes should feel natural and unconstrained and related to what you're doing rather than arbitrary, awful, and then of course, you know. I, I feel that this year's solution files was the first time in a while where I felt like the people writing the solutions mocking the solvers. Um, I still haven't read them. I can get through about three before I that. <laughs> um, so, uh, 